The next concept that we're going to take a look at regarding chord voicings is a concept called block chords. Um, now this is a term that's used uh, t t for by pianists and big band uh, in the context of jazz. Block chords are chords that are four or more notes sometimes that are basically chord voicings that harmonize a melodic note. So, for example, in big band jazz, you might have a melody, um, maybe an alto saxophonist would play the melody of a song, and then that melody would be accompanied by other horns, uh, such as the, fa the, the famous Four Brothers horn section, for example. So you might have two alto saxophones and two tenors harmonizing a melody in four different parts. Um, and then uh, pianists, in, a, in an effort to approximate that, would also play these figures, both solo lines and melodic lines, harmonized with three additional notes, or even more than three additional notes, underneath that melody. And those were subsequently called block chords. Uh, in the guitar world, a lot of guitar players would then try to approximate the sound of both big bands and pianists, such as George Shearing, um, by developing a way of navigating chords and playing them with the same facility as single note lines. Of course, Wes Montgomery springs to mind as, as he's an exemplar of this technique, uh, but Billy Bauer also played in this way, Johnny Smith, lots of great guitar players, Kenny Burrell, are, were adept at this style. And essentially... It's just the concept of taking a harmony, a single note line, and then harmonizing it with notes underneath that. So the, the way that we can physically achieve that on the guitar is by starting off playing root four chord voicings. And what I mean by that is that the root or the, the lowest note of the chord, in this case, not necessarily the root, but the lowest sounding note will be on the fourth string, the D string. Okay, so even though we're, we're building it, we want to think of these, we're building it from the root four up, we want to think of these uh, actually top down because the melody note is going to be at the top and that's going to be the most important. The most common way of voicing these would be by using a drop two system of organizing notes on the fretboard. And drop two just means, um, in, in going back to the big band arranging era, if we had four parts, for example, four horns, um, then the second part, which would be part two, if you drop that down an octave, then that would give you a drop two voicing. You can think of this as, as almost like um, in choral music, you have four parts, soprano, alto, tenor, and bass. If you took the alto part, which would be the second part there, and dropped the alto down an octave, then you would have a drop two voicing. So for example, if we had low to high, one, three, five, seven, this would be uh, the alto the second voice from the top, we drop that down an octave and we'd have this. And if we fingered it a slightly different way, it would look like that, which is a lot easier to finger on guitar. So subsequently, drop two voicings became very popular with all guitar players, and Wes Montgomery used them uh, almost exclusively when he was playing his block chords. So the idea now is to take, if we were to start with the four inversions of a G minor 7th chord, as outlined in your example here, we're taking the four notes of G minor 7, G, the root, flat 3, B flat, 5, D, and flat 7, F, and we harmonize each of those notes with the other three chord tones in the minor 7th chord voicing, then we have this block chord. So the first G is harmonized with the other notes, D, B flat, and F, and it would sound like this. The next note, B flat, is harmonized in this way. The next inversion is... And finally, the third inversion is... So we have four different voicings which capture the sound of G minor 7. But the important concept here is that you're not just kind of playing chords, but rather you're playing chord voicings that harmonize a melody. So you're thinking top down. You're harmonizing this. And on a technical note, Wes Montgomery would play these using his thumb. Um, so he would simply use his thumb to brush down on each of these chords. Now, another uh, concept that we can use is, is the concept of passing tones, um, meaning if we were to play p either chromatic passing tones or scale tones, how would those be harmonized? So um, once you get a handle on all of the different inversions for each chord types, and we'll go through them here uh, quickly, but in addition to minor 7, we have um, the first voicing starting with a G minor 6. 
which is also the same upper structure as a C9, and that's, that's, that's notated uh, in your example there. It's indicated with the chord symbols. But there's a lot of duality here. So for example, this structure can be used for a G minor 6, but it can also be used as a C. And Wes Montgomery and Billy Bauer, you know, they would, they would interchange these chord voicings freely, understanding that the function of the chord could, is, is more than one possibility. You know, there's more than one situation. You could use this for a C7 chord or a G minor chord. So those G minor 6 inversions would be... If we're going to play a major sound, um, most of the time, uh, instead of playing a major seventh chord, which might have some dissonance in it, such as this, kind of that minor ninth sound, uh, a lot of guitar players would default, and piano players as well, would default to a major sixth sound, which the shapes actually look just like the relative minor, E minor seven. So a G6 would look like an E minor seven chord, and then move through those same inversions. So you'll recognize those same shapes from the G minor 7 example that we just played through, but now we're thinking in E minor because E minor is the relative minor to G major. So that's just a little trick. Finally, if we're working through dominant shapes, um, there are a lot of different ways to approach this. Um, you could play just the straight-up inversions of a G7 chord. But one thing that uh, Wes liked to do, as well as Joe Pass, would be to come up with a little bit more colorful voicings that might involve the ninth or the thirteenth. So what you have on your uh, handout here is basically the first chord voicing is, is a G13, followed by a G7, followed by a G9, and then another G9. But again, what's important about this is to understand the ways in which you can harmonize the melody at the top. So if, for example, our line was, if we just looked at the top note in each of those chord voicings I just played, our melody might be G, B, and then D and F. And then we could harmonize that in those different ways. Now going back to the... the, the the passing tone concept, if we had a melody that, that involved playing a scale, for example, meaning notes other than just the arpeggio, the chord tones, then we have to figure out a way to harmonize those passing scale notes. So let's go back to G minor for a second. And if our, if our melodic line was... Then we have some notes that are chord tones, such as the G, B flat, and then finally the D those can all be harmonized with chord tones of the G minor chord. But what about the in-between notes? Well, a common practice that pianists and big bands and then Wes Montgomery would use is harmonizing those passing scale tones with a fully diminished seventh chord. It sounds great, um, but it's also easy to finger because those are symmetrical voicings as well. So if we look at the handout, we're starting off with a G minor 6. And we can harmonize that A in the melody with a fully diminished fingering. Then we'll harmonize the next B flat with an inversion of the minor 6. Then the next note in the melody is C. We'll harmonize that with another diminished chord. And then we're back to our chord tone, and we'll harmonize that with an inversion. So of this melody, the three chord tones will simply be harmonized with chord inversions. The passing tones, the A and C, will both be harmonized with diminished chords. If you put them together, we have this example. And if we're in the context of a major sound, we can still use the same approach. So if we're working, let's say, over changes in G major, we would harmonize the, the G melody, the, the G chord tones. Those would be harmonized with G6 voicings. And again, the passing scale tones would still be harmonized with diminished chords. So put them all together, we have this. Here's the melody. That melody harmonized with chords would be...